reason for what well, I'm about to present now is an R package that I put together myself. So I'm going to start by talking about the reasons why I did this. Um, and my particular agenda here is meta-analysis. I'm a zooarchaeologist, but I'm particularly into meta-analysis of zooarchaeological data, with most of the problems of which probably are pretty much in common with any other form of data, to be honest. Um, and one of the things that's happening at the moment is the sheer amount of data is mounting. Uh, particularly in areas where you have large-scale commercial archaeology, development led archaeology and so on, more and more data is generated, the old data doesn't go away, and so the total volume is increasingly making large-scale meta-analyses um, so a very powerful tool. They used to be very kind of patchy, these days we often have quite high densities of data. Um, my view here, well there's two things I think worth saying about meta-analyses of zoological or other data. One is that I think meta-analysis makes reproducibility especially important. Now, reproducibility is always important in research, I think. Um, but particularly in, in meta-analysis, because of two particular scenarios, which are firstly repeating your analysis with new data. So to have the ability to, um, you know, if you've done a study, five years later, there's been a massive motorway project and there are another 200 sites. It's quite useful for you to rerun the entire study without starting from scratch. Um, the second point, of course, is that somebody else might come along and say, Actually, I think you made some really bad decisions in your analysis here, <coughs> and then go and change it. So I was talking yesterday to Leslie Bartoshevich, who reviewed a paper I did recently, you not this one, something unrelated, and he was saying, well, probably you should have used a slightly higher cutoff point for your sample sizes. Well, the code is going to be published with it, so he could go through and change the 2 in 200 to a 4 in 400, and suddenly he'd be able to, with about 5 clicks, I think we worked out, re reproduce the whole analysis using his cutoff rather than my cutoff. That's an extremely useful thing to be able to do. Um, my second point about meta-analysis is that there are always two possible components, spatial and chronological. If the spatial and chronological is the same, then you're looking at the same thing. Um, so if you're meta doing meta-analysis, most of the work that's really been done has been focusing on tools for spatial meta-analysis. So there's vast amounts of GIS work um, looking at you know, producing open source tools for the kind of thing that's on the right here, it's an archaeobotanical study in London. Um, There's an awful lot less done on how we deal with chronology. Um, we saw some very interesting tools yesterday, the Periodo tool. Um, but when it comes to actually doing the analysis rather than kind of getting data talking to each other in the first place, there's very little work on how we actually deal with chronological uncertainty outside of the explicit radiocarbon literature. So people like Stephen Shannon doing projects on combining radiocarbon data directly. When dealing with any other form of dating, things tend to get done on a rather ad hoc basis. So I've designed an R package for dealing with that problem. The methods here are entirely inspired or ripped off from, however you prefer to look at it, from Enrico Kremer. So there's a little plug there for the paper that gave me the ideas. Um, okay, brief outline. Um, I'll start by defining why I see this as a problem. I'll go into the possible kind of statistical methods that I think are worth using. And then I'll introduce the software with kind of a demonstration study of um, what it's been used for. I may then have time to give a very quick second demonstration, I may not. Um, so the problem here is you're combining sites from, you know, well, combining data from multiple sites. Here we have three fictional sites in London. Um, but they don't all have conveniently overlapping phases and context dating and so on. So you see in these three sites you have three very different situations for the dating. How do you then combine data from all those different phases in a single analysis? Now, traditionally, people would do this sort of thing where you probably split it up into bins. They might be centuries, they might be uniform, they might actually be more based around pottery chronology or major events, so they might not be uniform. And then you do something kind of something kind of rough, like taking the midpoint of each phase or each context thing. Well, if the archaeologist says it lasts between here and here, let's take the middle and see which bracket that falls into. Now, this is problematic because, amongst other things, you're forced to balance resolution with accuracy. So if you make the bins very wide, you've got a pretty good chance that most of your dates are going to end up in the right, you know, most of your contexts will end up in the correct bin, the true date will actually be in the bin they've been put in, but then you lose resolution. If you make the bins smaller, your resolution increases, but you'll have a higher and higher rate of contexts whose true date actually is not where you put it, um, which is not ideal. Um, so the first method that Enrico comes up with and that I've tried to apply here for dealing with this is something called heuristic analysis. Um, which is basically where I describe it as playing Tetris. Um, and it works more or less like this. 
let's say you have a context with a start date and an end date as supplied by the excavators. You say, well, that context has a probability mass of one. It must have happened at some point in that duration. So you can start to build up effectively a sum probability distribution for those of you familiar with the radiocarbon literature, but using a uniform distribution instead of a radiocarbon derived one. Um, then you've got another context, and this one's a bit better dated. It's only half the date range, but it still has a probability of one. So you have to double it up. So you have to keep the area the same, so expanding it up. And then you drop it down, and this is where the Tetris comes in. This would work much better if it was sideways. Um, and then you have another context which is really well dated, and that ends up contributing a lot more in terms of your probability mass on the, on the y-axis. And you do this with all of the contexts in your study, all of the phases, all of the sites, whatever it might be. Pile them all up together. Eventually kind of say, yeah, and eventually come up with something like this. Well, you then do a bit of a jump, which doesn't quite work in theoretical statistical terms. You have this big sum probability distribution, and then you then say, we're going to treat this as a frequency distribution. And so we're going to pretend that this is actually a proxy for the frequency, as opposed to being actually just kind of a you know, probability distribution. Incidentally, that is also a criticism of the entire sum probability literature in radiocarbon, but I'm not going to go there because I don't think any of those guys are in the room. Um, okay. Then what you do, probably for kind of practical purposes, is again you chop it up into bins and you actually end up presenting the data as a histogram. Um, now the advantages of this are firstly that it is deterministic. Lots of people are much happier if you have an analysis that gives you the same result every time. I don't understand it myself, but some people like that. Um, it's mathematically quite simple, computationally slightly less simple, but the actual underlying maths are extremely simple. Um, and it makes a lot of sense if you assume that your date ranges are basically duration. So if you've got a context that's dated, let's say London, 1538 to 1666, if you assume that that means it formed continuously over that process, this kind of makes sense. If, however, you assume that it represents uncertainty, that context formed at some point, we just don't know whether it was, <coughs> we don't know it was after the dissolution, 1538, and before the Great Fire of London, then it makes a little bit less sense. Um, but one of the biggest problems here is you can't estimate confidence intervals. You have no idea how reliable this distribution is. Um, and you can't test for increases or decreases, which is often what we're actually interested in, whether something goes up at a certain point or goes down. If you're testing a historical or an archaeological model, that's often actually what you're looking at. And I'll come back to that point later. Okay, so the second method, one which is kind of my favorite method, is a simulation-based <laughs> approach. So the same three contexts, but this time you randomize the date from each of them, and then you randomize another date from each of them, and I'm not going to pick through this a thousand times, but you do that a thousand times, two thousand times, five thousand, however many, and theoretically you should keep doing it until the results converge, but five thousand tends to be plenty. Um, and you end up with something looking like this. This is a kind of a median and a 95% confidence interval, because you, you look at each one of those kind of thousand runs you ran, you look at the dish, you build a histogram and compare them effectively. Now that's I'll be visualizing this in a moment, so if you can't visualize what I'm talking about, bear with me. Okay. Um, so what I've done is built a package for dealing with these two situations. Um, it can do heuristic analysis, it can do date distribution simulations with some extra kind of functions that go along with that, and it has a series of plotting functions using R's base, base plotting platform, but kind of customizing within that. Um, and it also does rate of change simulations, which I'll, I'll explain what I mean by that later on. Um, but the important point here is the data input is extremely simple. All you need to feed into it is a table. You can read in CSV or get the table into R, whichever way you prefer. Um, yeah, table with unique IDs, start dates, and end dates. And you can also feed in a column of weightings. So this is some zoological data where I have fragment counts. Or you can just not do that and everything will be weighted as one automatically. Um, okay. So the demonstration here involves um, the MOLA database and some fish bones. So some fish bones from one of the, what, the biggest archaeological company in London. It's a reasonable size sample, 30,000 odd bones, 81 sites, 6,500 environmental samples, about 95,000 litres of processed sediment went into this. So it's not a bad sample. Um, and this is what it looks like if you do heuristic analysis. Unsurprisingly, you find that there aren't many there aren't many fish in London when there's anything going on in London about here. But um, it's kind of where you'd 
the peaks fall kind of where you'd expect them, except that apparently London kind of fades away after the medieval period and never became anything significant after that. Um, but we'll come back to why that is in a moment. And then this is the equivalent menu simulator. And there are three different functions for plotting the results. You run a function called data simulate, and it gives you a particular output type, which then you can feed into one of these three plotting functions. This is default. It's just a very thin veneer over the basic R box plot. Um, this is my favorite one. Plots it to polygon. You can specify what confidence intervals you want. 95% is the default, with the medians down the middle. Um, if you look at things like this, where you have a big wide confidence interval, you might be wondering why that is. And for that reason, I made the third plotting function, which actually just plots every single one of your runs as a separate line, with a very low, trans very high transparency, rather low opacity, all on top of each other. And then you start to see what's going on when you have wide confidence intervals, which is the there's one or two contexts here which have a lot of fish bones in, and as they move around in the simulation and move between different bins, they make a disproportionate effect on the results. So you can start to see where your where your uncertainty is coming from. Um, but of course, none of this means anything unless you have some idea what variation you expect. So you can also run a um, a dummy model, a null model. Um, so in this case, the grey band I hope you can see in the back is a uniform dummy. So you tell it um, to take the same sample size, the same kind of sample lumpiness in terms of numbers of you know, weightings per context, but just ignore all the dating information and just simulate it as if everything was dated 0 to 2000 or whatever the date range of your study is. How much variation would you expect by chance? And that's that band at the back. Now, of course, you wouldn't actually expect this. So that would be a ridiculous null hypothesis that the amount of fish bones excavated from London are time independent. Because apart from anything else, it's going to be dependent on the amount of research that's been done, research intensity. So what you can also do is feed in a user-specified dummy, which in this case, I uh, first of all did the heuristic sum of the wet sieved sample volume over time, so how many litres of soil have been sieved in London by NOLA over time. And you can see they've actually sampled the early Roman period to death. But despite that, if you run it through as the dummy model, this grey band in the background is what you would expect if the only factor deciding how many bones you get is how much sitting you do. In which case, you'd expect lots of Roman fish, and you don't get any. So that's quite, quite reassuring then. Um, why do I care? Well, what I'm actually interested in is looking at the onset of marine fishing. So you can also obviously do comparisons. And this is comparing freshwater fish at the top with marine fish at the bottom. And you can see that again, in the early medieval period, the Saxon period about here, you get freshwater fish, there's a reasonable amount of sampling being done, but you still don't get any marine fish. So it's kind of confirming that that effect is not just the result of dating and is not just the result of uh, research biases. Okay. Um, there's also a function which is usually kind of built into the main simulation function, you can call it separately, called uh, rate of change. And what this does is works out in, for each one of your runs. Is there an increase, or what is the increase or decrease between one bin and the next? So actually, if you're interested in, you know, is there really this big increase in marine fishing at 1000 AD, which is a big thing if you're into environmental history, um, this is basically telling you that yes, there is. So you run the simulation, and between the 10th and the 11th century, all the time, and, and basically 100% of the runs, you get a substantial increase at that point, which is usually what we're actually interested in. I mean, nobody really cares that there were 500 fish bones recovered in London within a particular 50-year block. What they do care is, was that a statistical increase on the previous, the previous block? Um, so this is actually a really useful thing that you can only do with a simulation methodology. You can never do this with the heuristic methodology. Um, OK, something completely different. I'm just going to mention in passing. That's my main study. That's why I did this. I did this for the sake of people being able to deal with, you know, kind of in a in a reproducible, in a transparent way, rather than kind of fudging it, deal with the date boundaries they have on large data sets. Um, but it did occur to me, it's also actually exactly analogous to the situation that those of us who work on animal bones, perhaps also human bones, although the stats get a lot more complicated there, um, it's exactly analogous to the situation we have when we're doing age of death studies. But in this case, um, instead of years, centuries, and contexts, you have individual specimens that might have been aged to in the standard system, we have these kind of these eight categories with rough ages, and a label on this should be years across here. But you quite often get animals which are, these two can be given a particular age estimate. These ones, well, they're a bit broken, 
So you can't put them into an individual bin. But you can apply exactly the same principle here. Those of you who aren't zoo archaeologists probably don't know what I'm talking about. But this is just one slide for the benefit of those who are. I haven't yet actually done this, but I think it's going to be a lot of fun. But I put it in just to illustrate that I kind of hope that this package can be used for things that are not the original kind of date ranges from medieval cities idea that they had in the first place. Um, okay. And there is, and there is a, an extra function that I threw in. I will stop in a second. There's an extra, fun, extra function that I put in specifically to create, to turn the quite complicated objects that the basic functions produce into survivorship data, which is what you need if you want to plot age of death studies, basically. Um, that's the end, basically. It's a work in progress. It's on GitHub. It was supposed to be on ground by now, but it's not because I haven't got around to fixing a few little problems. And in future, I plan to build in radio carbon support as well, but that's going to be quite a hassle. So it might, not, might be well before I get around to it. And that's it. <laughs>